Hello everybody and welcome back to another brainstorm. Today we're going to be talking about our three states of matter. So this video is aimed towards key stage three science, but it's also the foundations which you'll need for the GCSE course, especially for chemistry and physics. So we're going to split this video up into three main parts. First of all, we're going to discuss what are our states of matter. We've got three of them and what are the different properties for each state of matter. Then we're going to go on to talk about how do particles interact and how are particles in each one of our states of matter. And then we're going to round off the video by talking about the change of state. How do we change a substance from one state to another? So let's get into it. Okay, so we're going to start off by talking about the three different states of matter that a substance can exist in. And then we're going to go on to talk about what are the properties of a substance in each one of these states of matter. Okay, so for any given substance, there's three different states of matter that it can exist in. The ones that we're going to look at in this video are our solids, our liquids, and our gases. So, for the purpose of this video, we're going to look at water as an example. So the water that you use in your house, the water that we drink, actually is now existing in a liquid state, okay? You'll see that in the little picture here. Now, if you think about water in the solid state, that's what we commonly know as our ice, which you may use in your drinks and whatnot. And then water in the gas state, sometimes we call it steam, but the scientific and proper name for this is going to be water vapor. Okay. Now, an important thing to note here is that the substance isn't actually changing in each one of the states. So you'll see in each one of these three pictures, we've still got water. So the actual thing which we're talking about doesn't change at all. So the state of matter is just a different form for the same substance. OK, so we can look at this in a little bit more detail when we're considering the properties of each one of the individual states. Now, bear in mind, we're still talking about the same substance here. So first thing that we ask ourselves is, can you compress or squash the substance in each one of these states? OK, so if you think about the solid, go thinking back to our ice cube, which we were talking about. If you are applying a force onto the ice cube, it's not going to get any smaller. So we say that we can't compress the solid. And exactly the same for a bottle of water. You can't make the particles go any closer to one another in a bottle of water, so you cannot compress it. But it's a different story for the gas. We can actually compress the particles in a gas. You'll most commonly see this in a can of air freshener or deodorant. So if we think about a can really big, and we say we've got six particles of gas inside of this can. Now, if we make the can a little bit smaller, what's special about the gas is that we can keep the same number of particles in the can, but they're all a lot closer now because they're in a smaller can. And that's called compression. We've compressed the particles of a gas, but we wouldn't be able to do that with a solid and a liquid, and we'll talk about that in a second why. Next thing we ask ourselves is, does that substance flow? So as you'll know from a solid, you can't flow a solid, but you can pour or make it flow a liquid or a gas. And because both the liquid and the gas can flow, we give them a special name. These are both called fluids. Okay, so finally, we're just gonna consider the shape of a solid, liquid, and a gas. So if we think back to the ice cube for the solid, the, it's got a fixed shape. If you leave an ice cube inside your fridge, it's not gonna change shape. So we call that a fixed shape unless you apply a force. What we mean by this is if you think about a football, for example, if you squish it hard enough, it's gonna change shape to an extent. Now the liquid takes the shape of its container. So if you think back to that water, the shape of the water depends on the shape of the bottle that you put it in because it takes the shape of the bottom of the container. Now the gas is a bit similar because it takes the shape of the whole container rather than just the bottom. Another way we can talk about it is that it fills the container that it's in. And an example of this is you can think about the room which you're sat in right now. Think about the air inside of that room and it's filled up the whole room. So the gas doesn't really have its own shape, but it fills up the whole container. All right, so we've just talked about the different properties of each one of the states of matter. Now we're going to go on to talk about what are the interactions between each one of the particles in each one of these states of matter that means that they have the given properties. Okay, so this is really going to explain why is it that if we have the same water, why does the water act so differently in the solid state compared to the gas state? Well, the first thing that we need to remember is that the actual particles that we're using do not change. So the substance doesn't actually change. But what happens is in each one of the states, we have a different particle arrangement and a different particle structure. Okay, so we're going to start off by talking about the solid state. Now you'll be able to see the particles of a solid here now. 
So the first thing that you'll notice is that each one of the particles are touching their neighbors in a fixed pattern. So the first thing that we see is that the particles in a solid are very, very close to one another. And because of this, we cannot move them any closer to one another, which explains why we cannot compress the solid. Okay, so the second thing that you'll notice is the particles cannot move away from one another and all they do is vibrate on the spot. And because of this, the solid has a fixed shape and it also cannot flow. Okay, so that's particles in a solid. If we move over to our particles in a liquid, which you'll be able to see here now. Okay, so the first thing that you'll notice is that in the particles of liquid, they are again touching their neighbors, so they're all relatively close to one another, again explaining why we cannot compress the particles in a liquid, because we can't make these particles go any closer to one another. But what's a bit different about the liquid is that these particles can actually move from place to place, and you'll notice that the way that they do this is they actually slide over one another to get to where they need to be. This explains why the liquid cannot hold its own shape and also why it floats. Okay, so that's particles in a liquid. We'll finish off by talking about particles in a gas, which you'll be able to see here now. Okay, so you'll notice that the particles in gas are very, very different to the liquid and the solid. Main reason is that they are spread out very, very far. So the particles in a gas do not touch the neighbors. And so because of this, we've actually got room to push these particles towards one another when we compress the gas, okay? What we'll also notice is that the particles in a gas fill up the container that they're in, and they also move very, very fast and very, very randomly, okay? And the reason for this is that the particles in the gas hold the most amount of energy. You'll notice that the particles in a solid have the least amount of energy, but we'll come on to this when we talk about change of state. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at how do we change a substance from state to state, okay? So first thing that you'll see here is that a substance can change state when it either warms up or it cools down, okay? So the first thing we need to know is that when we warm a substance up, the substance is going to gain energy. So we have to add energy to it to warm it up. So when we warm it up, it gains energy, and when we cool it down, it loses energy, okay? So for these state changes, they each have a special name depending on this change of state, okay? So you'll see those names right here. First of all, we've got a solid to a liquid. So if you think back to our ice cube, when the ice cube becomes um, just normal water, we say that the ice cube has melted. So solid to liquid is melting. And then if we think about the opposite, liquid to solid, then it has frozen. So it's freezing, okay? You'll notice that the red arrows show warming up and our particles gain energy, and the blue arrows show that it's cooling down and the particles lose energy, okay? So, now if we imagine the water becoming water vapor or steam, we heat it up and that process is known as boiling or evaporation. There's a subtle difference and we'll talk about that in a bit. And then the gas in the opposite direction, for the steam to become normal liquid again, it has to condense. And somewhere you might see that it might be on a cold window if you breathe against it, you'll see your breath condensing on it. Okay, and one more that we're going to touch on briefly is sublimation. Sublimation is when a gas turns straight into a solid without going through the liquid phase. As somewhere where you might have seen sublimation is dry ice. You'll see the gas coming off it straight away. All right, so now we know what the different state changes are called. We're going to look a little bit more in depth about what happens to the particles in each one of these state changes. Okay, so we're going to look at melting and freezing for our example, okay? So each substance has a unique melting point. That's the first point. Okay, so this idea of the melting point is just a fancy way of saying this is the temperature where the, the substance that we're talking about is either going to melt or it freezes. It's the point at which we see a solid to liquid or liquid to solid state change, okay? And because each substance has a unique melting point, we can use this to identify different substances. So for example, if we've got two different beakers and they both have a substance in, substance A and substance B, what we can do is we can boil both of them or melt both of them and see what temperature they both melt at. And that will give us an idea of what each one is. So a little example of this is that for water, pure water, the melting point is 100 degrees Celsius. So if one of these was water, it would become a um, liquid at 100 degrees. Okay, so if we look at closer look at particles, okay? When we add temperature to them, we said that the particles gain more energy, okay? 
And so because of that, what's going to happen is, remember when we said our particles are just vibrating about fixed positions in the solid state? Now they're going to start to vibrate faster. And eventually they're going to gain enough energy so that they can break free from those fixed positions which they're in. So once they've broken free of their fixed positions, these particles are free to slide over one another from place to place. And you remember that that is the property we talk about of a liquid. So we've gone from them vibrating on a spot really quickly as the solid to now being able to move over one another as a liquid. And this is the same principle when we're thinking about a liquid going to a gas in our process of boiling or evaporation. It just happens that these particles begin moving over one another faster until they can break free of their neighbors and fill the container that they're in to become a gas. All right, so we're gonna quickly take a look at the purity of a substance. So first of all, what do we mean by purity? Well, when you look at something in the supermarket, it might say pure water, pure fruit juice. That just means it's only got that fruit juice or that water in it, okay? So in, in chemistry and physics, when we talk about something being pure, it only has one substance in it. So if we're talking about pure water in science, we, that water is only gonna have particles of water in it and nothing else, no other impurities as we call them. Okay, so if we take a look at this temperature time graph for a second, you can imagine this being us heating up a beaker of water and plotting its temperature every single minute. So as we know, we can say that at room temperature, it is a liquid our water is, so 20 degrees our room temperature. When we heat it up, it's gonna, its temperature is going to go higher and higher and higher, and its particles are gaining energy as it's approaching the boiling point. So again, just like a melting point is a point at which a substance melts, the boiling point is when it's boiling. Uh, and it's going to reach somewhere around here, okay? Now, if this was water, I just use that as an example, this should be 100 degrees. This particular graph here shows us stearic acid which is a chemical that you might come across in the lab, which has a boiling point of 70 degrees C, okay? The reason we know that that's the boiling point is because it's a flat line at that temperature. What's happening here is that at the boiling point, there's no increase in temperature because here, the energy being supplied to that substance is used to give all of these particles enough energy to break free. So once it's finished breaking free every last particle, it's going to carry on heating up as a gas as well. Now, a pure substance, something that we need to remember about a pure substance is that it has a fixed melting and boiling point, okay? So for example, for our stearic acid here, it's melting and boiling point is 70 degrees exactly if it is pure. If something's impure, it might melt or boil over a range of temperatures. So if this was impure stearic acid, we might have had a result of around 68 to 72 degrees Celsius, for example. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you guys all for watching. Please make sure you hit like and subscribe if you've enjoyed the videos and I'll see you guys soon.